Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you to the lovely Kid Rock for the intro. Uh, he'll strike me for it, but, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it. Good to get a little Kid Rock in your day. So, I am really excited to do this. Uh, so, like I said, we started kind of out of place. We started with the race riots a couple weeks ago, uh, and then we had a different topic to cover last week. Um and this week, I'm ready to get back into what is Detroit, Michigan, besides the greatest city on the face of the earth. Uh, so we're going to get into some of the history, uh, and we'll go a little bit outside of Detroit today, because, of course, nothing happens in a vacuum, and sometimes we have to take into account some of the other areas of the state of Michigan and of the world that had influence. In the lovely city of Detroit. So, I'm going to say hello to everybody, and then we will get right into Detroit, Michigan, from the year 1600 to 1775. Uh, I think it would have been okay. What's up, Jason? Uh, Dog Mom, hello, hello. AP, hello, Sarah. Hey, Linda. And that looks... That looks like it for now. So, like I said, we're going to get started here. Detroit. And some of the things that we're going to eventually go through, we're going to go through Motor or Motown Records. Uh, we'll go through the big three, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that will be later in the history. We're going right up to the start of the Revolutionary War today. So, that should be fun. So in 1600, the Great Lakes tribes, so these are the Indian tribes or Native American tribes that inhabited the area of Michigan before settlers started coming. Uh, as you can see, there was a lot of different tribal regions in here, but the main ones in the state of Michigan were the Potawatomi uh, in the north, the Sauk tribe, uh, the Miscotton tribe, the Fox tribe, Miami tribe, Kickapoo tribe, 
Shawnee. Um, and those are some of them. And, and some of those moved as, as time went on. Um, and some of them are, are smaller factions of a bigger, bigger tribe. Um, so my tribe is Saginaw Chippewa, which, which moved into the thumb area as, as time rolled on. Um, and as the Europeans started to come over and start getting into the area. So, uh, so basically the, the major breakdown of the tribe, there was about a hundred thousand people that lived in, in the five major tribes in Michigan. And like I said, those were broken up. So those were the Potawatomi, the Ottawa, Ojibwe, uh, Chippewa, oops, Chippewa, Miami and Huron. So, um, so yeah. And, uh, the Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Ojibwa spoke a similar Algonquin language and are known as the people of three fires. So you'll see a lot of the lakes and fires represented in in Michigan. Uh, the name Michigan means big lake um, in, in that kind of uh, Algonquin language. So a lot of it stayed. So a lot of it after... After I civilized and came over to what's up, Alex? Good to see you, buddy. Um, once it came over to uh, the European settlers, they kept a lot of of these areas and and a lot of the the historic names. So, um, it was it was like anywhere else in the United States at the time. We had a bunch of Native Americans or uh, Indian tribes that were that were vying for resources. Uh, and then, and then as we'll see, what's up, Comer? Uh, and then as we'll see, we started to get a lot of European influence into this great area. Uh, for those who don't know, number nine, right about where that number nine is, is where Detroit is. So that would be the Fox tribe. Um, and as you'll see, once we go a little bit further, you start to see a lot of interaction with the French and the natives, and it became a very big fur trading destination. Um, it was it was huge because we had the waterways. Uh, Canada was up there, and and they had a bunch of uh, damn Comer, X Comer gifted at ten Mighty Meat memberships. Thanks, buddy. Uh, if you don't have memberships on, what the hell are you doing? Throw it up there. Uh, turn on your memberships, please. And thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. So, Samuel de Champlain, who founded Quebec, sends Brule on an exploring mission. He is considered the first European to set foot in Michigan. So we start seeing a lot of the, a lot of the Europeans coming over. Obviously, it was resource rich here, um, and resource heavy. And and there was a lot to, uh, a lot to really take advantage of. I mean, it's a beautiful area for one, and for two, uh, its its economic value is huge, especially to the new colonies. Um, and and just around this same time, this sixteen eighteen time, a couple of things that were happening outside was uh, there was a settlement in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, Hudson sailed to New York and claims it for the Netherlands. Uh, Englishmen settled in Jamestown, Virginia for the first permanent English settlement. Uh, Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts is a little bit after this. Uh, Dutch settle in New York City. Um, so, so there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of people coming to the new world and, and exploring. So a little bit longer, uh, 1630, Samuel de Champlain sends Jean Nicolette to find a passage to China. Obviously, again, they didn't really know what was going on map-wise or, or what it actually looked like. So, uh, Nicolette, if you go to, if you go to historic Mackinac City, um, most of the stuff is on Nicolette Street. Again, just giving homage to a lot of 
a lot of that uh a lot of those early explorers and and a lot of those early explorers naming things after after a lot of uh a lot of the natives that that were here first so he passes through the Straits of Mackinac and explores the shores of Lake Michigan. So, again, that was a really interesting time. Uh, the So those who don't know, that is what connected Lake Huron to Lake Michigan. Um, and actually, we can look at that area. Uh, I'll probably mute it. Two, two, two. Okay, so when I search, how the hell is my video not the first that comes up for me? Like, I understand that there's other videos. But how does my video not come up the first for me? That almost makes no sense. Like, my video doesn't even come up. I need to look and see what these are. These are named. Um because I should probably use the algo. Although this did get a decent number of uh, views. So the area we're talking about, and I'll have to mute it because I don't want to... Well, yeah. So this is a video that I made a while back during our Labor Day celebration. It is a sea of green. It's fantastic. Hey, Daisy. So this is the Straits of Mackinac. So this is the upper and lower peninsulas, and this is the connecting Great Mackinac Bridge. And all this water out here is the Straits of Mackinac. So it's a thin strip of water that connects Lake Huron to Lake Superior. It's beautiful. It has a, a ton of strategic value for different resources and shipping. Um, <clears throat> we saw a lot of the areas at the time were heavily dominated by, can I get a boat there? Because boat was the main method of transportation. Like you didn't have gas engines at this time, but anybody could jump, jump in a canoe or a boat and uh, and transport goods. So, um, my that's that's very true. Michigan and Huron are one lake with two very different currents and shorelines. Um, yeah, it is, and uh. You'll see some, you'll even see some differences in, uh, and like the makeup of the shore. Like, uh, some of it is very rock heavy and not a lot of fun to go out in. Um, and then there's beautiful sandy beaches down, down US2, um, in the, in the upper peninsula. But on the other side, um, that's where you get a lot of your, uh, wash ups of, the Petoskey Stone, which is a great Michigan stone. Um, Detroit's lovely. You just you just have to be a Detroiter to love it. <laughs> so, um, we're very kind to our own people, but outsiders were not were not necessarily as fun to. Uh, so this is again, this is Mackinac, and this is Straits of Mackinac. So this is the area we're talking about. We won't watch the whole. 10 minute video but just want to give you a reference of where we we're kind of talking so uh and again passage to china so they were looking for china they were looking to trade spices and and all that kind of stuff uh so that was the idea is hey can we get to china um not can we find a new new land to settle but they did uh and then 1650 to 1700 and there's a lot that happened in this specific area. Have you got any nudist beaches? Uh, when did they leave the inside lane? I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Huron's incredibly rocky. And, and Michigan's just beautiful. And uh, has the dunes and all that kind of stuff. So. It's not paved. It's paved until you get to the grades. Then the grades. Exactly. <laughs> um, there's some resorts. There's not beaches. It's not like Europe, but uh, private resorts. So 
European diseases have a powerful effect on Native Americans. As many as half of Michigan's first people hate saying that, but that's how it was written. Um, and didn't feel like changing it. Die from the disease in the 17th century. So, as we know, with many of the other colonies, they brought over a bunch of disease, and it killed off a bunch of natives. Uh, our bodies weren't made or we didn't grow up with those kind of diseases, so it would literally be like aliens. Um, yes, yes, you would. Yeah, that seems about right. <laughs> so, uh, in 1668, French missionaries returned to settle in Sault, settle in Sault Ste. Marie, and. If I'm not mistaken, I believe Sault Ste. Marie is Michigan's oldest city. Um, I'm going to look that up. Uh, so it is. It is indeed from 1668. It was settled, which makes it Michigan's oldest city and among the oldest cities in the United States. Um. The Sioux is a beautiful area. That's what we call it. It's Sioux St. Marie, but we call it the Sioux. The Great Lanes suck. The Great Lanes are terrible. I won't drive over them ever. Uh, but Sioux St. Marie is... is uh, So it's big claim to fame now is the Sioux Locks, which... Uh, bring all the boats from Lake Superior down to the level of Lake Michigan and Huron. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm not, I mean, just naturally, like, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure why there was such a development, probably because we didn't interact, but um, I know it did kill a lot of our people off. So, uh, but anyways, uh, French missionaries settled in the Sioux, um, now the Sioux is known for for the locks. It has a city on the other side, also called Sault Ste. Marie, but it's Ontario, uh, Canada. Not big population up there, but uh, it's. I think it's still the only Walmart in the Upper Peninsula. I could be wrong. They could have put one in Marquette, but I think it still might be the only Walmart in the Upper Peninsula. Um. We had more French show up. French explorer Adrien Joliet and Iroquois guide travel from the St. Mary's River down Lake Huron and camp at present day Detroit. Uh, so, again, more people come to the area. It was a big trading hub. There was a lot going on. Uh, and they traveled from down the St. Mary's River. Um, down Lake Huron and and camped in Detroit. What was Detroit? Um not founded yet, obviously. Very small. Uh that's like three weeks. Well, there's there's some of that in <laughs> there's some of that in here. Um they put that in the there's a long history there, but uh that that will probably be two or three weeks from now, actually. So Hey, I am Princess. Good to see you. I don't know why this picture didn't come up. Uh, Missionary Rene de Brehart, de Gallini, and Francois Dyer de Quesan travel from Lake Superior upriver on their way to Sault Ste. Marie. Again, it was the first established city. It was, I think this was a good picture, so... Oh, no, this is just a creepy guy. This is just the, the explorer, but he's on the thumbnail. So, no, it can't be because it's too wide. I don't know why that picture didn't translate. That's what I'm... So, I don't think it was that one. Well, I'll see which one it's not, and then and then I'll bring it up. Because it might be... It might not be that important, but... Hey, what's up, Jacob? 
so there should have been a picture here, and I don't know why it didn't end up there. Um, so again, we have more of these these prominent explorers that going up river from Lake Erie uh, on the way to the Sioux, and yeah, in Michigan we call it the Sioux S O O because nobody's spelling out Salt Saint Marie, uh, so it's T H E S O O the Sioux. Uh, good. This is the picture I wanted it. So, uh, and then a little bit later, we have more French missionaries. So we have, um, they start coming in later, but we have, uh, Father Marquette, who's very well symbolized still in Michigan lore and, and UP lore and culture. Um, and again, a lot of this is happening right up here. And maybe that's what I should show is a map because I like maps. Especially if they're in wood chippers. Inappropriate. Uh, we use MapQuest so I don't dox myself. Okay, so. That's why Detroit is a stink hole. You can't even say your own lake names or whatever. That's not a lake name. That's a city name. And it's just shorthand. So you get a lot of people coming in. This is the St. Lawrence Seaway, this big body of water. So this comes in from the ocean. So you'd have, obviously, um, you have, obviously, Europe. And they're all coming from Europe to settle and to to look for to look for stuff. Um, yeah, that's the first thing is people are like, oh, it's spelled soul. No, it's fucking Sault Ste. Marie. Get over it. No, we just don't want to explain it to dumb people, Bobby. <laughs> so you have people that come in the St. Lawrence D-Way. Uh, the first lake they're going to hit is Lake Ontario. Um, so that's this body of water right here. Toronto is off to the north of Lake Ontario. And some of them, you know, uh, some of them are a little intimidated because right in this area right here, I wish they had a telestrator for this. Like, um, I wish they had like a telestrator so I could point stuff out, but uh, they don't actually live there. They just survive there. Yeah, the Sioux gets rough. Um, so there's a really intimidating waterfall here, the Niagara Falls. So this is Niagara Falls in Buffalo, New York, and this is where uh, I could see that it would be relatively impassable with their boats. So a lot of them would go across Canada, and you get a lot of Canadian settlement in this area. That's why you have some of the bigger cities, Toronto, Kitchener, London, and Ontario. Um, Shizzy had an overlay that them draw shit on what's being streamed. I'll have to reach out to him because that's... That would be nice. That would be really nice. Uh, and then they would, if they decided to, you know, move their, uh, wanted to move their canoes and, and carry them over, uh, then they could drop into Lake Erie, which we have officially, officially given to Ohio because nobody likes Erie. So we, we actually, we actually gifted this to Ohio. Have fun. We don't want it anymore. You guys made it look like shit. Uh, so then we get into this. And this little body of water is another one that was very important at the time. And this is Detroit River. So Detroit River goes up all the way into this heart-looking body of water called Lake St. Clair. Lake St. Clair is where Javi Nooner is. Um, well, actually, that's in the rivers and the lake. And it's a beautiful lake to go boating on. I've done it several times. It's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. So, um, and off here is where you have 
uh, like the Ford House and, and a lot of Detroit's history. So there's a lot of there's a lot of that kind of thing in there. And then we go up uh, via another river to Lake Huron. So Lake Huron is the one that looks like a guy. Uh, you can say a bear or a lot of people say it's a fur trader with his backpack. Um, cause you can kind of see a person out of it. So here is the Straits of Mackinac that we were talking about. This is, uh, this is Mackinac city on the lower peninsula side. And this is St. Ignace on the upper peninsula side. Here we have Lake Michigan that looks kind of like a bean, soybean, or maybe a worm. And then we go up to Lake Superior, which is the big cold lake that nobody would have went on, especially at that time. I love my state and I love my city. And this is Sault Ste. Marie. So this is what we're talking about right here. This is the Sioux. Um, as you can see, there's the locks and the Sioux and beautiful I-75. So that is what we're talking about. And that's kind of the area and what we're looking at. It does kind of look like a flaccid. Yeah, I could see that. So, uh, so back to this, this is, uh, the French, the French map. So this is French territory, Nouvelle France, um, all the, all the new French territory. And we have British on the outside. So the Hudson Bay company was a big trading company. And then you had the British colonies, the original 13 colonies that were on the outside. And then right in the middle of those two lines, you had this contested area. And as we know about uh, contested areas, they get dicey. <laughs> so what do the French start doing? The French start building forts. Uh, so they build one fort out here by Lake Michigan. And this is by St. Joseph, Michigan, down here almost to Indiana. Um, and it's it's definitely right here in this then no vicinity which i don't think you can see because i can't show uh but i'm not shit we'll flip over uh right here so like in this area right here and this is saint joseph green haven holland michigan that's that's kind of what's out here so almost to the indiana area uh chicago's obviously over here but but this is the area we're talking about they also built forts in detroit they also built forts right here, which was Port Huron. And they built uh, Fort Michelin Mackinac at the tip, at the point of the. Fun, this is cold to the bone. Yes, it is very cold. Very cold. Uh, so the French obviously started building forts. It was It was important for their territory, important for. A lot of the money that they're making off the the quote new lands um and then the last thing that kind of happened in this 1650 to 1700 branch here uh august 10th french explorer robert la salle sails a ship from griffin past detroit on his way north to find a route to china so again they weren't they weren't originally looking for anything here they were looking for a route to china um so they could trade uh, you had the East India Company, um, the Hudson Bay Company. All of them wanted to get the spices from from China, from India, back to Europe. They were going the wrong way and definitely landed in the middle of the Americas. But, it, I mean, it was probably good that they figured out that it was here. Um, LaSalle explores the lower peninsula of Michigan, crossing from present-day Muskegon, to present-day Detroit, becoming the first European traveler to travel the interior of Michigan. Uh, so, again, just for reference sake, so Muskegon's up in this area here, I believe. Yeah, right there. So between the two rivers. Um, so Muskegon's here, 
and he actually walked all the way across to city of Detroit. They absolutely did. <laughs> they absolutely did. Yep. Yep. Northwest passage. Uh, and they thought it was through to the area that's now Michigan. So, uh, that's a long trek. I've driven from Muskegon to Detroit. I would not, I would not look forward to, uh, to passing it on foot. Um, that would not be a fun journey. So, uh, and then we go to 1701, July 24th, 1701. Antoine, oh, I thought this was Antoinette. Antoine de la Mole's Cadillac establishes a settlement at Detroit. So that's how old the city of Detroit is, older than America. Um, that makes it, what, 302 years old? 322 years old. Terrible math, sorry. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yes, it does. That's so fast. Uh, he leads 100 French soldiers and 100 Algonquins because they started working together. They had they had severe economic interests. They had crazy economic interests. So, um, with all the fur trading and stuff that was going on, they they were very much allies at this point. Um, they obviously did not really care for the British either either side of them. Uh, and the French and Indian enemy just naturally hates Dazzer because of it. Like, I try and tell him this, but Algonquins to the Le Detroit, the Strait, they built Fort Ponch... I always fuck this one up. Ponchatrain du Detroit from logs. The goal is to protect the French fur trade in the Great Lakes from the English and the Iroquois. So... So again, you had you had warring factions. So they knew the British couldn't leave stuff alone and wanted to just keep pushing. They also knew that the French, uh, the fur trade was an incredible economic opportunity. So they built the city of Detroit. They built the fort. I wish the fort was still here. It is not. Um, the The fort in Detroit is no more. Um, I don't, I mean, I know kind of the site it is, um, but I don't, I don't believe there's even anything there to commemorate it at this point. Uh, so we get into Detroit's firstborn and a little bit of the, uh, the lore behind how it kind of got settled. So fall and early winter of 1701, Cadillac asked, Native Americans to settle in the area. He offers protection and trading opportunity. The Huron, Miami, Ottawa, and Chippewa build villages in the surrounding areas. Uh, so you had this peaceful coexistence of the French and the natives that were that were working together and had common interests. It was beautiful. Uh, and then on 1704, of February 2nd, the first European child is born in Detroit. Mary Therese Cadillac is the daughter of Antoine and his wife. So, uh, yeah, and you see a commonality um, with, so Cadillac was obviously a, is obviously a car brand that comes from the Motor City. Uh, another nod to the founders. So, and then we start getting a little bit of tension. Well, I mean, it's a picture from like 300 years ago, bro. They all look kind of alien. <laughs> so, uh, French tension in 1704, Cadillac reports that 2,000 Native Americans live in the villages surrounding Detroit. So, obviously, people started moving in, and 2,000 people was a lot of people. It was starting to grow. It was starting to be productive. It was starting to be an economic hub. It was starting to to do all those things. Um which which drew attention. It drew attention from the Brits and the Germans and uh, everybody else who wanted a piece of the pie, but the French were already here, and they were at least going to act like they were going to fight for it for five minutes. Uh, and then I thought this was kind of funny. In 1706, on June 6th, the first major confrontation between the French and Lodo 
local Native Americans occurs when a commander's dog bites an Ottawa Indian. Uh, fire, fighting leaves Father Nicholas de Hale, St. Anne's priest, and 30 Ottawa Indians dead. So, <laughs> over a dog bite, over a dog bite, uh, that much, that much. Uh, so crazy things happen <laughs> and, uh, you know, some of the, some of the greatest tensions and biggest wars come from absolute nothing. And sometimes it's just kind of crazy, kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, over a dog bite. I'm sure there was some other reason, but then uh, <laughs> I'm sure there was some other reason attached to it, but that was the historical documentation of the and it and it went fairly quickly. Um, it it wasn't a huge fight. It just seemed to be more of a it seemed to be more of a mild inconvenience, if we're being honest. So, uh. And then Cadillac turns into a landlord. So he starts being a little bit more overbearing, uh, try, starts to get a little bit greedy, starts to get a little bit of that, um, a little bit more of needing some some monies and stuff like that. Uh, so from your map, you can see Lake St. Clair. This is where Detroit currently is. This is Detroit River. And this on this east side is Canada. And this is a breakdown of the of the different neighborhoods and areas. So Cadillac begins granting lands around the Detroit to French settlers. He acts as a landlord and requires settlers to pay him an annual rent plus a percentage of their crops. 1709 Count Pontchartrain Cadillac's French supporter complains in a letter that Cadillac is greedy because of the amount of rent and crops he requires from his settlers. Uh, so Detroit suffers its first Karen from somebody who's just trying to make some more money. And oh yeah, I'm sure you treated him really poor. But I can also see making money. And if you're designing and building a city and money's rolling in, then that's kind of uh I can see both ways, but uh, the French government removes Cadillac from his position as commander of Detroit. God, I love that job. He becomes governor of the French colony of Louisiana, and he does not return to the city of Detroit. So much like Kwame Kilpatrick, 250 years later. More tensions. In 1712, tensions between Fox Indians from Wisconsin and the French at Detroit escalate. The, French, the Fox attack the fort for 19 days. On retreat, the Fox are overtaken by the Huron, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, who are loyal to the French. The French rebuild the fort at Michelin Mackinac to gain access to the upper Great Lakes. Um... We're going to take a trip through Michelin Mackinac as we get closer to that 1775 towards the end. It will probably be actually the end. Uh, what's up, Vaza? Uh, but it's heavily British in the history um, because it is. Because it was overtaken by the British right about the time that we were about to fight the Revolutionary War. But that's an aerial picture before um, of, of now what it looked like before. They've done a great job preserving uh, that specific fort and do some really cool enactments, reenactments. Uh, if you're ever up there, uh, it's worth a visit. So, uh, Detroit's first hater, 1720. Detroit's population is about 200 people. Church indicates that there were 
43 baptisms, 7 marriages, and 15 deaths for that year. In 1721, Detroit's first hater, Father Pierre de Charlevoix, stops at Detroit during an exploration trip of the Great Lakes. He reports that the settlement is run down and suffers from neglect by the French government. So, uh, yeah, he, uh, he said it looked like shit. So he was definitely Bobby's, uh, Bobby's great uncle, maybe, but yeah. Damn, it started already at 1721. Yep. Uh, so death in life, 1730, the register of St. Anne's Parish records 106 baptisms, 16 marriages, and 44 deaths in Detroit. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful church. Uh, we're going to take a look at a virtual tour in a minute. Uh, but it's still there. And on October 15th, Antoine de Lamont Cadillac dies in France. So really the founder and, and kind of uh, the backer of the city of Detroit. Uh, no. Uh, in 1733, those damn Europeans brought over smallpox and kills many of our residents yet again. So another European disease kills off more loyal Detroiters. So we're going to go through this. Uh, this is from the Archdiocese of Detroit, and this is St. Anne's. It's a beautiful church. On July 24. 1701, Antoine de la Montagne landed downtown at approximately the location of Hart Plaza. Two days after landing, Cadillac laid out That's the International Bridge. St. Anne's first edifice. The name St. Anne was picked because she was the patron saint of the French in the New World. It was her feast day on July 26th. And so it made sense to name the church Street. after the grandmother of our Lord. St. Anne's went through many uh, alterations through the years. There were times when they rebuilt this, the log cabin structure. They would enlarge it or modernize it. Uh, there were approximately five or six log cabin structures, which preceded the first permanent structure, which was called the Stone Church. And it sat at Bates and Larned and was the immediate predecessor of the building in which we sit today. In 1880s, the parish had become too large for the size of the stone church, and many of the French-speaking parishioners came here and built this church in 1886. They also brought the Bobian bells. They brought the body of Gabriel Richard, the altar rail, which was carved in 1853. They also brought the uh, original 1818 cornerstone and placed it in the left front of this building. Uh, they also brought the gray clerestory windows, which are at the top of the edifice. And those are some of the oldest stained glass in the state of Michigan. One of the items that had been brought so to gorgeous. the church is the statue of the uh, St. Anne with the young Virgin Mary. It has been a shrine destination for many many years i have no idea and there have been many uh, healings and miracles associated with it in uh, 1911 the detroit press ran a front page article about a young boy who had had an incurable eye disease so he brought the young boy to the novena and shortly afterward his eyesight began to improve the young man placed the eyeglasses that he had been wearing on the saint anne altar and left without them. The current church was built in 1886. It took approximately one year to build and it cost just a little under $100,000. The original structure is built in a French neo-Gothic style of architecture, which is all pointed arches. The Gothic arch is very prominent throughout the building, all the way down to the spires on the very ends of the pews. Every single thing in the building lifts one's spirit and mind heavenward, which is our true home. One uh, can wander through the, the church reading the names on the stained glass windows. 
you'll find the Bobian name, the Visgers, uh, many of our street names, Saint Antoine. Uh, those were the French settlers whose whose strip farms uh, laid along the the river and where their farms were became the names of our streets. And those people were all parishioners here at St. Anne's. One of the major artifacts that was brought from the stone church was the altar, which resides in the chapel, which is also the final resting place of Gabriel Richard. Um, the, the altar came from the 1818 church. It is the altar at which Gabriel Richard served mass for the last few remaining years of his life after the church was built. Well, there couldn't be a more multicultural parish in our diocese, one that began a French parish for well over 100 years and evolved uh, all throughout the, the years as Spanish-speaking people began to move into the neighborhoods in the 1940s. And by the 1960s, uh, approximately half of the masses, as today, are, are, are said in Spanish. Had it not been for the influx of the Spanish-speaking people, the parish probably would have faded away back in the uh, back in the 1960s. So we've we've managed to survive into the 21st Beautiful. century. Uh, we've we've managed to celebrate 319 <laughs> years of uh, service to this community, and with Almighty God's help, we'll be here another 300 years. So that's Ambassador Bridge. So that's Canada on the other side of the Detroit River there. Um, just a beautiful church. I felt like it was worth highlighting. So uh, gorgeous, gorgeous church. Uh, so back to the fort in Detroit. Hey, Digger. Oh, we're going to get there. Where it has... My my art history class went over how these churches were built. That's cool. That, that would be neat to to learn about. So it is. It's it's a gem. So all right. So back to the fort. Tensions in North America between the French and British increase. The French send one hundred and fifty troops from Montreal to strengthen Detroit's fort against the Huron Indians, who are allied with the British. So again, we're starting to see these two factions of we're starting to see the British and the French pulling away Indians from from their respective groups and and starting wars between uh, using people that it wasn't their best interest. Let's just leave it there. Uh, Detroit's population is about 900. The governor of New France offers animals and farm equipment to Frenchmen who settle in the area. Only 46 people accept his offer. So, a lot of independence. In, and again, just the the story of Detroit, the independence and the, the hardworking and no, I don't want your handouts. Like, that, those are Detroit values. They are, truly. So then we get into these damn Germans. So they got to come in and fuck everything up and disrupt everything. So, first of all, this is what they thought that the state of Michigan looked like. Kind of this dilapidated. I mean, they weren't great at maps, but the technology wasn't there. So, you know, we did the best with the technology that we had, but that's what they thought Michigan looked like. Obviously, Lake Huron looks like it looks like a dolphin with kind of a phallic wee wee. And Lake Michigan was pretty close, actually. Pretty close. They just had proportions all wrong. Um, the French operate seven forts within Michigan to protect their fur trade in the region. Again, huge economic value for for the native population and the French that settled here. Uh, Detroit's population is 483 people, including 33 enslaved Native and African Americans. So we have 33 enslaved people and now the Wayne County Jail has tenfold that number probably easily uh, I am not German I can very clearly chase my lineage and I am mostly French and then native uh, Michael Yax begins farming in present day Gross Point 
He's considered the first German settler in Michigan. So a little bit further north, Germans start farming. Uh, and since they do, I wasn't going to put this in here, but I feel like it's important. I really do. Uh, shortly thereafter, the Germans started settling. Settling. Abraham Chapman arrives in Detroit via Montreal. He is believed to be the first Jew to settle in Detroit. Peaceful. 150 years. Beautiful, peaceful area. Nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. Germans come in. Some Jewish settlers following them. And the whole thing goes to fuck. So in 1752, the French-Indian War, smallpox and famine threatened the settlement of Detroit. 19, or, excuse me, 1754, the French-Indian War begins, which is part of the Seven Years' War between England and France. Detroit is a major stronghold for the war. The French militia sends over 400 militiamen and supplies to the fort. So. Uh, you know, other other places come in. the The Brits are starting to move in. We now have Germans in just north of Detroit, and and everything goes to hell. So I've actually done a video on the the French Indian War before, um, and I wasn't going to go in very much depth, but I am going to share uh this shorter. It's a shorter three minute video. Just kind of going over and explaining the French Indian War just a little bit. Yeah, we kicked the 22-year-old George Washington's ass. Like, bad. Like, it was bad. Really bad. But here's a little bit on the French Indian War. From the very beginning, colonialism in America meant competition. European countries were eager to gobble up as much land as possible in the New World. Sometimes this competition turned into open warfare, and the French and Indian War is a perfect example of this. Here's a crash course of five things about the war to get you up to speed. North America was a big, beautiful place full of endless opportunities, and Great Britain and France each wanted a piece of the action. The British controlled their 13 colonies and were looking to expand west. The French occupied Canada and were looking to expand south. It was inevitable that they'd bump into each other, and that's exactly what happened in the Ohio River Valley, an important trading area with access to the Mississippi River. I just I just said we we lived in peace and prosperity for our, over 150 years together. And then we have one German and one Jew move in, and everything goes to shit within two years. That's not coincidence, brother. Not coincidence. The French and Indian War marked the debut of 21-year-old George Washington, a lieutenant colonel for the militia in the British colony of Virginia. In 1754, he was ordered to protect a British fort near... Nazi fags! ...what is now Pittsburgh. On the way, Washington encountered a French military unit, and the two sides fought in the first battle of the French and Indian War, the Battle of Jumonville Glen. Washington was young, but he was quickly gaining the experience he would need to eventually command the Continental Army. Years of territorial scuffles turned into full-blown declarations of war in 1756. As fighting broke out, the British and French sought allies among the local Native American populations. The French were familiar with many tribes through trade and recruited the Potawatomi, Winnebago, Ojibwa, Mississauga, and the Huron, while the British turned to the Iroquois Confederacy. At first, the French were winning. A lot. They simply had more troops and better supplies than the British Army and drove them back towards the 13 colonies. But the tide turned in 1757 when British Secretary of State William Pitt took control of the war effort. Dreaming of a vast British empire, he made it his mission to defeat the French in North America, pouring in generous funds to beef up military resources on the ground. The war ended with the French defeat at the Battle of Quebec and the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1763. The British gained control of Canada and all land east of the Mississippi River. It may seem that the British made out well after all was said and done, but there was a catch. 
You see, William Pitt borrowed heavily to finance the French and Indian War, which left his nation in tons of debt. To make up for it, the British taxed American colonists up the wazoo. Americans didn't particularly appreciate this. Years of protests, rallies, town hall meetings, and petitions would eventually lead to the American Revolution and the creation of the United States. The French and Indian War may not have had the glorious battles or fearless heroes of other great conflicts. Bobby, he's but it was eight. one of the most consequential wars in American history. It also opened the eyes of a young military leader to the tyranny of the British, a man who would go on to be the first American president. Oh, we don't want to show it where I got it from. So that's just a quick rundown of what, what ended up happening and what, what ended up going on. So, uh, again, very peaceful. And then it all was not very peaceful. <laughs> so, again, we, so there was a lot of fighting, a lot of fighting here. And, and again, Michigan was one of the economic capitals and the city of Detroit was huge for the fur trade. So, got brought into this um yeah exactly uh 19th or i keep doing that my apologies 1760 british major robert rogers and his troops take command of detroit as part of the treaty at the end of the war britain obtains detroit from the french screw you britain 1760, the British discovered that Detroit has about 2,000 inhabitants and about 300 buildings. So again, a pretty good sized building, or a pretty good sized colony for, for the time. So, um, But yeah, the, the British definitely came in and took over. Um, coupled with that, uh, Chief Pontiac and his Ottawa tribe attacked Detroit and other forts in Michigan in an attempt to drive out the Europeans. So as soon as the Europeans took control, the Indians came back and tried to drive out the Europeans. Uh, he fails and eventually signs a treaty with the English. And then right after that, in 1964, uh, many Detroit inhabitants leave the village for the new settlements at St. Louis in present-day Missouri. Detroit's population is greatly reduced. So we had a bunch of different things that happened in, in great succession. We had a big war. Well, it started with smallpox. Then we had a big war between various Indian tribes, the British, the French, and several others. After that, um, we we then had another attack from the native population on the British, who didn't like how the British were handling things. And then a new city in St. Louis opened up, so you saw a lot of people vacate and and go to Missouri. Um. See, when the Brits took over Detroit, everything went downhill. Exactly. Exactly. So there was a lot of things that really, really just took some of our population away. So we were kind of started rebuilding. Uh, we were under British control now. So, of course, it was going to go to shit at some point. And, and that's kind of where we got to. So in 1769, I thought this was very interesting. <laughs> and I knew it wasn't much. Knew it wasn't much, but uh, we traded Belle Isle, or the British traded for Belle Isle for, for nearly nothing. Uh, a British lieutenant named George McDougall buys Hog Island, the present day Belle Isle, from the Native Americans for eight barrels of rum, three rolls of tobacco, six pounds of vermilion paint, and a wampum belt. So, that's uh Belle Isle's beautiful the week before race weekend. Um it used to be a lot of fun when I was a kid. They had a big ass slide. I don't know what the hell a wampum belt is. I guess I should look that up, shouldn't I? I started to earlier and got scared. Oh, it's a Native American Okay. Wampum belt. Okay. Oh shit, I'm not sharing. It's a so it's a belt. It's a beaded belt. That's what it says a wampum belt is. So 
uh, from the American Museum or the National Museum of American Indian History. So, so relatively good trade. Bell Isle is beautiful sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, um, it it was a lot of fun when we were when I was growing up. There was a big ass slide. Um, there was a zoo there at one point. There was all kinds of stuff. And uh, and I really enjoyed going to Belle Isle as a kid. Uh, then went downhill, and if it's not race weekend, the only thing you can get there is hookers and drugs. Um, legitimately. But it's beautiful. It's off. It's, so it's the northeast side of Detroit. So this is Detroit City down here. That's the Ren Center. Uh, at the tip of that shit you can't see my mouse again uh so directly down that point um so yeah <laughs> ramen tobacco sounds good um so bow i was beautiful and and they have the the grand prix down there the bow grand prix and and stuff like that which now i actually moved back to the city of detroit but it was down there for a long time um so yeah that's that's kind of where we they started trading started yeah, so many crackheads <laughs> unless it's race weekend like the weekend before race weekend they clean it up they clean it up before race weekend so uh but it is it is pretty when they they put a new DNR animal refuge on the on the north side of the island. I don't know if you've been down there recently, AP, but it, it was it was decent. Um, and there's also the shipping museum that's over over here on the west side of the island. Uh, the waterway museum that's that they they've been trying, but so anyway, 1771 Detroit. Is the center of the Great Lakes fur trade. Native Americans exchanged pelts and furs for European goods like guns, cooking utensils, cloth, and jewelry. So they start offering them all these these comforts from uh, all these European goods and stuff, and they're just looking to to make money and and stuff like that. So they're perfectly content with that. So. Uh, not much to, not much to, uh, really change about that. Uh, so then, so then we obviously start getting into the war. So now we're at 1771, 1771 to 75. There's not a whole hell of a lot that happens. Um, they have a new census or a new population update. Detroit's population is 1400 with 280 houses. Um, and then we don't have really much that happens until the Revolutionary War. Uh, so that's where we're going to stop with the history portion of it today. Uh, so next show we'll go into the World War and uh, probably up to the mid 1800s, maybe a little bit longer. I'll see. I didn't know how long it was going to take, so I tried to guesstimate. So. Yeah, it, it it's beautiful when it's up. It it really truly is, but um but now we are going to take a trip through Fort Michilimackinac. So again, very very instrumental in the creation of the city of Detroit, very instrumental in the French keeping the city of Detroit and keeping everything that oh we're not done. We're not done yet. We're just doing a Michilimackinac tour. Um, and there'll be more next week, but I thought the war was a good cutoff stop, cutoff spot, um, just a natural cutoff spot to to deal with. So uh, this is Michelle Mackinac. We'll we'll discuss. This is still actually there. Uh, the Mackinac Bridge runs over the visitor center for Michelle Mackinac. Um, so if you're ever up in the northern Michigan area. Uh, you just did. Why would I have to? Uh, so if you're if you're ever up in the area, I I truly, 
truly suggest giving it a go and and taking a look at it. But uh, as you can see, we'll get into we'll get into a bunch of the different histories and stuff like this. This is from the uh, Michigan Mackinac Straits Historic Parks. So, so this is from the Mackinac Councils. Michelin Mackinac, Michelin Mackinac, Michelin Mackinac. But, um, been here, they do live cannon firings. It's really fucking cool. You can, uh, you can go on certain days. It's really expensive. Um, but you can fire all the cannons on, on site for the opening of the, of the fort. I will do it at some point, but it's very expensive. Um, so. But it's but it's on my list. Maybe next year. We'll see. But now we're going to go into the historic fort. We're going to learn a little bit about uh, the history of Michelin Mackinac, the British campaigns, Pister, whatever the fuck Pister is. I don't know. The fur trade. Some more about Native Americans in the area and other campaigns. So. We're going to learn about the fort and its importance because this is really the linchpin. This is what brought Detroit to Detroit. Um, so I'll jump in here off and on. But Hi there. I'm Craig, and I'm here at Colonial Michelin Mackinac in Mackinac City. Now, if you visited the fort in the past, you know that we're reconstructing it to what it may have looked like in the mid to late 1770s. That's the time period that we're interpreting here today. Uh, that's also the time period of the American Revolution. And believe it or not, the American Revolution, although most of the fighting took place hundreds and thousands of miles away from here, it did have some really big lasting impacts upon the community here at Michelin Mackinac. And over the past few years, we've actually been going year by year through each individual year of the American Revolution and taking a look at what was happening out east in Canada, around the world, and here at Michelin Mackinac. This year, we're going to look specifically at the year 1777, which is a pretty important year fight. in the, the military history of the war. But it's there's also a lot going on here at Michelin Mackinac as well. And something that's really important to the remember English about the year the 1777 yeah, were is that all those revolutionary events that are happening out on the East Coast and elsewhere, the they fort. have a direct impact upon the people here, especially the local indigenous people, the Anishinaabek. Those are the people who are probably most directly participating in the those events. And so over the next little while, we're actually going to walk around the fort and talk a little bit more about what went on here in 1777, how the people here reacted to those events and how they participated in them as well. So before we dive too deeply into what's actually going on here in 1777, it's important to just remember what Michelin Mackinac was at that time. And although we call it a fort today, and yes, there were British soldiers stationed there at that time. There were about 70 men from the British 8th Regiment of Foot stationed at Michelin Mackinac in the 1770s. It is much more a civilian community that just happens to have some soldiers stationed here. Again, there's those 70 soldiers of the 8th Regiment. At the height of summertime, there might be a few thousand people at this community. All of them, whether they were British, French Canadian, Native American, all of those people are here because of the fur trade. Michelin Mackinac is a great transshipment point for the Great Lakes fur trade. So there would be all sorts of trade goods being shipped out west from cities like Montreal and Quebec and Albany. These are manufactured goods like axes and knives and kettles, blankets, firearms, things that the Native Americans of this area want but maybe can't make for themselves. So those trade goods get shipped out here uh, to Michelin Mackinac. At the same time, there are furs being shipped out of Native American communities out to the west or up north uh, that the Native people have been trapping and selling to European traders. Those furs get shipped to Michelin Mackinac as well, and they're essentially trans-shipped here. It's not a business transaction. It's just unloading one canoe and putting uh, those trade goods or those furs into another. Michelin Mackinac is ideally situated for that because we're right here on the Straits of Mackinac. The water is the highway in the 18th century. And from this spot, if you're motivated enough, you can go really all over the eastern part of North America. So again, Michelin Mackinac is ideally situated to take part in that massive fur trading enterprise. And again, that's why most people are here. 
Now, as we get into 1777, you kind of have to step back a couple years to understand the events that are going to be happening. You actually have to go back to 1775, the start of the American Revolution, because in 1775, one of the first things the Americans decided to do was actually invade Canada. They thought that the Canadians would welcome them with open arms, that they would become a 14th colony joining the rebellion. Uh, and the Americans were pretty successful. They're able to capture Montreal. They lay siege to Quebec. Uh, and they actually occupy the major uh, cities of, of Canada for most of the winter of 1775, 1776. Of course, this is a problem for the British. And the governor of British Canada, a man named Guy Carleton, uh, actually led the resistance from Quebec. He was there besieged in the city for most of the winter. And in early summer of 1776, he got some reinforcements and he actually started a counterattack, pushing the Americans back, trying to drive them out of Canada. And the British garrison here at Michilimackinac, led by a man named Arndt de Peister, actually attempted to contribute to that counterattack. Now, de Peister knew that he couldn't send the soldiers out, out from Michilimackinac. They needed to stay here. And so instead, he turned to the Native Americans of the Upper Great Lakes. Uh, these indigenous people were trade partners, but they're also diplomatic partners, and they're going to become military partners. So in the summer of 1776, de Peister organized a very large war party of uh, tribes from all over the Upper Great Lakes and dispatch them to Montreal to assist the British with driving out the Americans. Now, de Peister didn't just send all of those indigenous people off on their own. Uh, he actually sent a few European liaisons with them, kind of chief among them being a man named Charles Langlade, who is born here at Michelinacan in 1729. He actually had a house over here in this southeast corner of the fort until the early 1760s. And Langlade's pretty interesting because his father was French and his mother was Odell. So he had both uh, European and indigenous relatives and allowed him to really easily move back and forth between both of those worlds and act as a liaison. Uh, de Peister really trusted him. A lot of the native people really trusted him. And he's going to become a key player uh, throughout the rest of the war here at Michelin-Mackinac, even though he didn't really actually live here anymore at that time. He lived over in Wisconsin. Now, Langlade's war party gets to Montreal midsummer 1776 only to find that the british have already been successful they've driven the americans out and so uh they basically are told thank you but you can go home now so they return here to michelin Mackinac without firing a shot but that's going to set a pattern that we'll see again and again and again throughout the war these war parties going out from michelin Mackinac to assist other British forces elsewhere in North America. Now, Guy Carleton, after successfully driving the Americans uh, away from Quebec and out of the city of Montreal, actually pursues them south into New York, uh, down Lake Champlain. But it's kind of a slow campaign. He's very careful. He's very considerate of his supply lines. And uh, a lot of people actually start to criticize Carleton for his perceived slowness uh, and his uh, lack of activity. Uh, they are able to actually, again, follow the Americans all the way down to the south end of Lake Champlain, near a place called, called Ticonderoga. Uh, there's a naval battle fought on Lake Champlain in October 1776, with the, which the British, uh, in some senses, win. But with that, Carleton decides to withdraw back up to Canada and wait until 1777 to try and fully crush the rebellion uh, in the New York area. Again, people criticized him for that. Uh, in particular, John Burgoyne, one of his officers, uh, actually thought that he had not been nearly active enough uh, and so went back to England in the, the, the winter of 1776 with all sorts of ideas about how he could be more aggressive, how he would be a better leader, and how he could actually envision the end of the war, at least in this northern theater. So let's actually go take a closer look at what the British war plans and their war aims were for 1777. So as 1777 dawned, the British were really trying to think about what their strategy would be for the year. They had enjoyed a whole string of successes in 1776, not only Carleton's successful repulsion of that American invasion, driving them back down into New York, but General William Howe, who commanded most of the British forces in the American colonies, also was able to drive the Americans out of New York City, really out of southern New York, across into New Jersey, and uh, really even into Pennsylvania at the very end of the year. And so the British were looking for ways to follow up on that. Now, Howe personally uh, decided that he was going to target Philadelphia. He was going to target the rebel capital and potentially capture the rebel leadership. Maybe that would provide a quick end to the war. 
Meanwhile, up north, Carlton put forth his own plans for coming back down south into New York, targeting Albany. But John Burgoyne, who had served with Carlton in 1776, he had actually gone back to Britain with his own much more aggressive plans that he was pushing to leaders in the government and to the king himself. Uh, and Burgoyne's plan, which was the one that ultimately was chosen, called for an army to again move south uh, out of Canada following the Lake Champlain corridor, going south towards the Hudson River, uh, perhaps towards New York City, but also with options to operate in western New York in the Mohawk Valley, but also to push east into Connecticut. Uh, there was some thought that perhaps if the British could encircle New England, they could more or less chop the head off of this revolution. If they could isolate the rebellious colonies there. See, and it, so it was more than just it was more than a it was more than just a site for the creation of michigan it it was really instrumental in what was going on in the new colonies so this was really part of the battle for america it really was and it became instrumental for a lot of different things so it had a lot of strategic value to the new united states and why detroit was a powerhouse coming out of it in the Northeast, the whole thing would just kind of wither on the vine. Now, something else that's very important that the British decided to do in 1777 was go all in on the employment of Native American war parties. They had done this uh, in small doses before. I mean, there is that war party that, for instance, comes from Michilimackinac in 1776. But by and large, the British had not wholeheartedly embraced using Native Americans as auxiliary troops and as allies on the battlefield for a whole variety of different them. reasons. But in 1777, the government decided that they would actively recruit as many Native American warriors as possible to operate alongside British forces. Burgoyne, in his plans, called for at least 1,000 Native American men to join his forces operating out of Canada. And there's a couple of reasons for this. The, uh, those Native warriors were intended to be used as skirmishers and as scouts, kind of relying upon their natural skills. Uh, but they were also to be used as a terror weapon. The British knew that a lot of Americans were terrified of native war parties because mm -hmm. over the past you know several decades there had been all of these small clashes between people out on the fringes of society basically encroaching upon native land native people fighting back uh, and so the native americans had this real reputation uh, as very fierce fighters and as something to be afraid of and the british decided that they were going to capitalize on that in 1777. Now, it's important to remember that the Native people who decided to cast their lot with the British were not doing so because they considered themselves British subjects. They didn't particularly care about the British war aims, other than the fact that the British shared a common goal with them of keeping those American colonists kind of out there towards the Atlantic coast and not allowing them to come out here into the West. The British didn't want them to do that for a variety of reasons, primarily economic. They wanted to maintain, for instance, the Great Lakes and the Ohio River Valley as a source of raw materials. Again, the raw material here at Michelin-Mackinac would have been furs, uh, and uh, the native people didn't want those American settlers coming out there because they knew that they would try and dispossess them of their land. They wanted to stay in their homelands where they had been for generations. Uh, and so again, the native people decide to cast their lot with the British by and large because they have a similar goal to limit American expansion. It's again, not because the native people were uh, overly loyal to King George or anything like that. They just shared a common goal. And it's very important to remember that all of these various native nations, they all exist more or less separate of one another. They all have their own needs and their own motivations. And that extends all the way down to the individual native people. There really was not a Native American general who could just order all of the men in his band or in his community to go off and fight. It really was an individual decision. Uh, and as a result, uh, it relied a lot upon the individual personality, the individual charisma, uh, the individual speaking skills of particular leaders within each community to try and convince other people to join up with them. And so Nowadays. Again, this native component to the campaign in 1777 is going to add a high degree of individuality. It's going to add a whole different set of motivations to the British war aims. Uh, and it's not always going to mesh very well with what the British want. The British had one thought way that they thought they were going to fight the war and one way they were thought they were going to employ these native warriors. 
these Native American people as individuals had a whole other set of ideas that sometimes lined up with what the British wanted, but a lot of other times didn't. And we'll actually see that as we move through the summer of 1777. Now here at Mishlamaknaw, people didn't really know that any of this is going on in early winter 1777. Charles Langlade, who had again accompanied that war party out to Montreal in the summer of 1776, he finally got back here in February 1777. But he had been traveling for quite a while, so even he was unaware of these brand new war plans uh, in this desire to recruit Native people. Uh, but there was some thought that more war parties would be needed. So as soon as Langlade returned here to Michelinackinac in February, de Peister tasked him with going to Wisconsin uh, and essentially starting to raise more war parties for use in summer 1777. De Peister himself turned to the local native people and started trying to feel them out, trying to get them uh, Basically, on they the just side used of the British, the trying to encourage them to join up with a potential war party. For their the bullshit. people who lived here at Michelinackinac, by the way, are the Anishinaabek. Uh, today, we might refer to them as Odawa or Ojibwa or Potawatomi. They probably refer to themselves as Anishinaabek. And again, there's a very large Anishinaabek community right here in northern Michigan around Michelinackinac. And De Peister would have been turning to that community to start recruiting for war parties. Now, again, because the world is essentially frozen out from Michelinackinac at this point, the lakes are frozen, so no one can really come and go. It, it was pretty surprising that Langlade actually made it back here in February. There's not a whole lot that's going to happen until the lakes thaw. That actually happens yep. in April. And let's actually take a look at how this campaign for 1777 began. Now, although in the summertime, Michelinackinac is a very busy place, it's very well connected to the outside world, thanks to those water routes. In the wintertime, it can be very, very isolated. It's very difficult to move when all the Nothing lakes are frozen. There. And so Nothing. the community here was essentially frozen out from the rest of the world uh, for the winter of 1776-77. Now, although Langlade had returned here in February, he had been traveling for several months, so even his information really wasn't up to date. And Mishlamackinac didn't really reconnect with the outside world until April 11th. That's when a trader named Lamoth arrived here, and he brought news with him of some of the late season victories that the British had enjoyed in 1776, uh, and some further inkling of the war plans for 1777. De Peister immediately dispatched more supplies to Langlade to assist his recruiting efforts over in Green Bay. He actually sent soldiers, at least a few soldiers, over to Wisconsin to assist those recruiting efforts. And De Peister also turned to some of the other traders here at Michelinackinac and asked them to use their connections within Native communities, really around the Great Lakes, to continue that recruiting effort. For instance, he sent people down to St. Joseph in southwest Michigan to really start recruiting there as well. Now, meanwhile, back in Britain, plans had been finalized for the coming campaign. Burgoyne was placed in overall command at the end of February. The king signed off on his war plan in early March. Burgoyne then recrossed the Atlantic and arrived in Quebec in early May. And just about a week later, by mid-May, he actually began the campaign. He started the army moving. And Burgoyne's army that he had assembled uh, there in Quebec was quite large. There were about 4,000 British troops, about 3,000 German auxiliary troops. There were some Canadian militiamen that uh, Carleton had activated to join the campaign. And there were already Native Americans serving alongside British troops with Burgoyne. Uh, they were primarily from the St. Lawrence River Valley, and most of them were somehow uh, associated to or related to the Six Nations of the Iroquois. And so Burgoyne set off on this campaign again to push down south through the Hudson uh, Valley towards New York City. There was also going to be a diversionary attack out of western New York uh, under the command of a man named Barry St. Ledger. He too was going to rely upon native people uh, recruited locally. Some actually came as far, from as far away as Detroit, uh, as well as other soldiers of the 8th <laughs> Regiment who would have been stationed at Fort Niagara. But again, that was always just exactly. They to use a diversion. natives for the everything. main thrust was going to be Burgoyne's main army Absolutely moving used them south for down along Lake Took Champlain, down the Hudson River towards New York City. Now, again, here at Michelinackinac, de Peister's recruiting efforts continued throughout this entire time. He did report that he started to see some hesitation, especially amongst the local Anishinaabek. Uh, back in February, when Langlade had returned, 
DePeister was actually worried that they were simply too enthusiastic. He worried that he wouldn't be able to stop any of them from going out there. He thought that everyone would just get up and go join that war effort. But by April, there was some hesitation starting to uh, creep in. DePeister blamed that not only on agitation from rebel agents down in the Ohio Valley, but also Spanish agents. Remember that Spain controlled most everything west of the Mississippi at this point in time. And although Spain had not yet formally joined the war against Britain, they did still have an interest in destabilizing and eroding British control out here. So de Peister really had his work cut out for him, trying to recruit people from really all over the Western Great Lakes, people with a whole variety of different motivations. Uh, and fortunately, he was rather good at it. So let's kind of pause for a minute and just take a closer look at what de Peister was doing here. Now, as I mentioned before, Arndt de Peister is the military commander of Mishlemackinac. That means he's responsible for the 70 or so soldiers of the 8th Regiment who would have made up the garrison here. So soldiers dressed just like I am right now. That obviously would have taken up a great deal of his time, but he has several other responsibilities on top of that. There really was not civil leadership here at Mishlemackinac in the 1770s. So a lot of those functions also fell to de Peister. Not only was he responsible for the soldiers, he was also responsible for the much larger civilian community here, and also responsible for making sure that all of those various people uh, essentially got along with one another and that everything ran smoothly. Mishlemackinac, again, is key to the Great Lakes fur trade, so it was on to Peister to make sure that the French and the British merchants here at Mishlemackinac, the voyageurs hauling all this stuff, the Native American trappers and traders who were supplying the furs, it was on to Peister to make sure that all of those people at least got along well enough to make sure the regional economy kept functioning. Now, on top of all of that, de Peister also acted more or less as the British ambassador out here to Native America. Because although Mishlemackinac is uh, very much a European settlement, and this is technically part of British Canada in the 1770s, those are kind of uh, loose concepts the further and further away you get from where we're standing right now. Again, this is Native American territory. We're in the homelands of the Anishinaabek right now, just as they would have been back in the 1770s. And so it was de Peister's job to act as a representative of the British government to all of these various independent sovereign nations scattered all over the Western Great Lakes. And fortunately, de Peister was very good at that. He was able to juggle all these various responsibilities, and he was a very capable diplomat. He understood the various motivations of all these various native groups, understood what they wanted uh, from the British, what they wanted from the fur trade, what they needed from uh, the British military here, and was able to actually make sure that everyone got along well enough, again, to at least make sure that the fur trade continued to function. Now, in the summer of 1777, those skills really did come to the forefront because by early June, all of those various war parties that had been recruited in places like Wisconsin or down in Southwest Michigan, they started assembling here at Mishlemackinac. Langlade brought a lot of people back from Wisconsin with him. People came up uh, from the South. And so in the space of about two weeks in June, 1777, there were about 400 uh, Native American warriors who assembled here and they came from a whole variety of different nations. About 150 of them were Anishinaabek. So they are the people who were living here at that time. De Peister placed them under the command of a man named Magic Hewis, who is an Ojibwa war leader who lived uh, right here locally at the Straits of Mackinac. Langlade brought uh, Winnebago's, he brought Sac and Fox, there were Potawatomi's that came up from the South. Uh, and again, de Peister had to juggle all of these groups as they came in, because although they had all more or less agreed to fight alongside the British, they didn't necessarily get along with one another. So for instance, in the space of one day, there was a Sac and Fox war party that came in, and there was also a Potawatomi war party that came in. De Peister knew that he had to send one of those groups away before the other arrived, because the Sac and Fox and the Potawatomi were traditional enemies. And he knew that if they were in the same place together, there was going to be trouble. So he very deftly sent some of them off first and kind of delayed the second group just to keep the peace between all of these various nations who are kind of gathering here uh, to fight alongside the British. There are Dakota people, so Sioux people who come out of the far west. They're 
uh, under the command of a, a leader named Wapasha, who de Peister had dealt with before. They all come here, they get outfitted uh, by the British. De Peister would have probably provided them with food, perhaps some ammunition, some other supplies. They probably would have had access to a government blacksmith to repair their weapons and other things. Uh, and then they would have all been sent out east uh, under the nominal command of various European liaisons. So for instance, Lunglad accompanied the main body out east and there were other French traders, traders with strong connections with the native community who accompanied these war parties as they traveled out to join Burgoyne. Although de Peister was very busy supervising the arrival uh, and departure of all of those various Native American war parties, making sure that they were equipped properly uh, and also spending a great deal of money to make sure that they had everything they needed, de Peister actually spent over 20,000 pounds <laughs> in the summer of 1777 to outfit those war parties. That's by no means the only thing taking place here at that time. Remember that most of the people who lived in this community were civilians and they were associated with the fur trade in some way. So for instance, the people who would have lived in this row house here behind me, they were civilians, most likely civilian merchants. Uh, and they enjoyed a very, very successful trading season in the summer of 1777. Now, after the British had driven the Americans out of Canada back in 1776, Guy Carleton, the governor, actually instituted some restrictions uh, to try and protect the fur trade. For instance, he required that any canoes or any vessels coming out here with trade goods have a permit. They had to have licenses. And of uh, about 155 total canoes that were permitted to come out into the West in 1777, 120 of them came here to Michilimackinac. The others went to smaller trading posts, but the bulk of them came here to Michilimackinac. And remember, those canoes, those bateaus, which are essentially large rowboats that are coming here, are full of trade goods. Uh, merchants would hire voyagers, so people to actually row or paddle those vessels. Uh, and then they would also buy tons and tons of trade goods to ship out here. And those trade goods could be axes, they could be pots and pans, they could be firearms, uh, especially they were textiles. That's probably the most common trade item, but they all get shipped out here to Michilimackinac. The merchants would often also come here to Michilimackinac and live here seasonally just to make sure everything ran smoothly. At the same time that those trade goods were coming out of the east from cities like Montreal, there would be other canoes full of furs coming out of the west, coming from Native American communities in Wisconsin and Minnesota, up into Canada, where there were other traders who had actually been living amongst the native people all winter long, buying up furs from them. It's the native people who actually trap the animals. It's usually the men nope. who do the trapping, women prepare the furs for sale. Those furs then get shipped here to Michilimackinac and the merchants supervise their transshipment. So you have all those trade goods here, you have all those furs here, and the merchants were here to make sure that everything ran smoothly as one cargo was unloaded and loaded into another vessel. And then when the canoes went back out west and up north to those small trading posts and Native American communities, they were full of trade goods. And those trade goods, again, you can think of them like money. You can think of them like cash because that's what would be used to buy more furs from those native trappers in the coming winter. Meanwhile, the vessels going back east to Montreal and ultimately over to Europe, those would have been full of all of those furs. So there's these two big circles going around and around. You've got trade goods coming out of the east, furs coming out of the west, and those circles intersect here at Michilimackinac. And again, that's why this place is so important. That's why there were all these people here uh, and why it was also such an ideal place to gather all of those war parties that were going to be sent out east because it's astride the main trade routes. So again, the summer of 1777, very, very successful for the merchant community here at Michilimackinac. The government had instituted a few other restrictions on the Great Lakes trade, uh, again, mostly to make sure that no trade goods fell into American hands. But at this point in time in 1777, they weren't particularly restrictive. The merchant community here wasn't too concerned about them yet. Over time, however, in the coming years, those restrictions would become uh, a little bit more burdensome on the merchant community. But again, in 1777, things went pretty well for them. Meanwhile, back out east, that main campaign, Burgoyne's main army is starting to move south out of Canada. So let's actually take a look at how that campaign began uh, and take it up to the point where the people from Michilimackinac actually would have joined up with it. Okay, so we're gonna go back Sorry, we're going to flip flop back to. Um, I just rebroke it up so we can 
take part in some of the other. So everybody knows the revolution. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on that. But so I just added another 10 years. It's like five more, five more, 10 more slides. Um, just so I can explain this and then we can be past the Revolutionary War because I was going to do a big ass thing about it. But then I was like, damn it, everybody knows what the revolution was. Um, so Britain's 13 colonies in North America demanded independence as the United States of America. Detroit is not one of those colonies. And it remained under the British rule from 1776 uh, till a little bit later. So it it remained British for for quite some time. Uh, it was not part of the original the original package and uh, still had a lot of French influence. So uh, also in 1776, British, the British fort at Detroit is reinforced with 200 to 300 British soldiers. Uh, the fort did not see a battle in this war, but is used as a base for sending raiding parties into Ohio. Also, the Citadel is used to hold American prisoners. One of those American prisoners. Wait, I don't know the revolution. Can you spend like 12 hours recapping it that quick? No. Uh, <clears throat> British Captain Richard Lerneau. Yeah, I said his name, Fred. Uh, builds a new fort at Detroit, which is named after him. So uh, the previous fort wasn't wasn't good enough. Uh, they built a new fort that resembled his namesake. They would not be there very long. The British hold American patriot Daniel Boone. Yeah, that Daniel Boone that you've seen in movies and stuff like that. Uh, who was captured by Native Americans at Detroit, at the Citadel in Detroit. So he was... Uh, uh, no, I'm good, Digger. Cheese, cheese could probably tell you about it, though. Uh, so the great Daniel Boone was held at the Citadel in Detroit. Captured by the British, held in Detroit. 1780 or 1778, April 26, British census records 2,144 residents at Detroit, not including military personnel or prisoners. It did include 138 enslaved persons. So 138 slaves, uh, most of them at this point probably black, uh, African American, whatever. Um, but a lot of them still were natives, but they needed the natives, so not as many natives as previously would have would have been involved. Uh, as we learned about earlier, General George Washington got his ass kicked in Michigan, and he abstained. In 1779, General George Washington considers, considers attacking the British at Detroit during the Revolutionary War, but he doesn't want that smoke and stays the fuck out of Michigan. 1780, the, exactly, the British hold approximately 500 American prisoners at Detroit. Some of them are held in jail, while others live with local families and are allowed to wander freely. So they used it kind of as a prison colony, uh, used it to hold people of interest and, uh, you know, it was that might be why Detroit is the Australia of the Midwest. Uh so like I said, the British didn't keep it long. September third, seventeen eighty three, Michigan becomes part of the United States. Major Ephraim Douglas enters Detroit on July fourth. However, the British refused to surrender the forts at Detroit and Mackinac. So uh this is the fort we're talking about, Michelin Mackinac, Michelin Mackinac, depending on your pronunciation. Um, but Michigan became a state, and the British still didn't want to leave, so they had to kick their ass one more time. Uh, 1787, and this will take us up to the end of the, like I said, I broke it up again, and then we'll be out of the war. Uh, at least the the Revolutionary War. We, we have a a whole hell of a lot more wars <laughs> coming up and a lot of them around Detroit and, and Michigan specifically. But in 1787 representatives from 12 of the 13 colonies meet to draft the United States constitution, the Northwest territory comprised of the future States of gross ass, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, fantastic Michigan and Wisconsin 
and part of Minnesota is created by an ordinance of the Continental Congress. They also banned slavery in the Northwest Territory. So the, the territories that were, were coming up, they banned slavery completely in those territories. So uh, interesting that they had the forethought to to not have slavery. Um, a lot of it was for economic advantage of the the East Coast dinners. But, uh, but yes, they did ban slavery in the newly formed territories that eventually became states um, in the Midwest. So that is all of that. I was just sitting here and I'm like, eh, why don't I break it up in half and and we'll do that. So we'll finish with uh, we have Native Americans and some other campaigns and some more about Michel Mackinac here. So at about the same time that De Peister was sending off that very large war party from Michilimackinac in mid-June, Burgoyne was formally opening the campaign out east. Now, in addition to the few thousand British and German and Canadian troops under his command, he did already have a sizable number of Native Americans aligned with his army. Uh, they came from a whole variety of tribal groups in the St. Lawrence River Valley and also in New York. Uh, and Burgoyne, from the beginning, intended to use those Native warriors uh, not only as skirmishers and as scouts, so operating out in front of the main body of his army, but also to use them as a terror weapon. Everyone knew that the Americans had kind of this innate fear of Native Americans based on literally centuries at this point of clashes with Native people out on the frontiers. But unfortunately, we're going to try to have it both Rumble. ways. He both wanted to utilize those native uh, warriors as a terror weapon, but he also wanted to make sure that they didn't go too far and give the British a bad name. He said he wanted to rein in their cruelty while keeping up their terror. And to that end, he actually instituted a series of rules that were supposed to govern the way these native men were going to fight on the battlefield. Uh, he specifically told them that they were not to engage in combat unless they encountered armed resistance. They were not to target non-combatants, so they weren't supposed to go after women and children or old people. They were not supposed to bring him scalps, expecting some sort of reward. He actually refused to pay if they brought him a scalp. He would, however, pay if they brought him a live prisoner. Uh, and he also forbade them from scalping living prisoners. They could only take scalps from people who were already dead. And this kind of ran counter to a lot of the ways that these native men would have been accustomed to fighting. Now, furthermore, Burgoyne didn't include any native people in his chain of command, and he also really marginalized and ignored employees of the British Indian Department, which was a government agency specifically set up to act as a liaison between the yeah, government part of and all of these various native nations. Burgoyne simply chose thing. not to listen to those people who probably would have had a pretty good handle on how yeah, the native I, people were thinking and the way that they wanted I to say fight. It both ways, but now as June progresses into early July, you know, that British that army is able to successfully move uh, southwards down Lake Champlain. Uh, they get to Ticonderoga at the south it's end of the lake where the Americans had built a huge stronghold, a huge fortified camp. They had also sort of re-fortified Ticonderoga itself. Burgoyne had expected to spend a lot of time at yours. Ticonderoga. He was planning perhaps to uh, besiege that place. <laughs> but instead, right around 4th of July, 1777, some of his engineers discovered that the Americans had failed to fortify some high ground overlooking Ticonderoga. So Burgoyne dispatched some artillery up there looking down at these American positions. The Americans realized that their positions were untenable. So by about July 6th, they retreated more or less without firing a shot. So Burgoyne had successfully captured Lake Champlain with very, very little resistance, but that came with a couple of failures. One, the Americans had essentially escaped. Since they had retreated before Burgoyne was set up to actually start a battle with them, they got away more or less intact. And furthermore, since Burgoyne had planned for an extended siege down at Ticonderoga, his supply lines were not quite ready yet to continue that chase as the Americans continued to fall back towards the Hudson yeah, River. We're all, we're so all as a result, the British the ended news, up just buddy. kind of sticking around at Ticonderoga for a few weeks as they waited for supplies to catch up with them. These problems are further made worse by the fact that Burgoyne and Guy Carleton, the governor of Quebec province, really did not like each other. Remember that Burgoyne was one of the ones criticizing Carleton for his actions in 1776. As a result, Carleton was in no hurry to 
uh, speed up uh, supplies down to Burgoyne. He was really in no hurry to release reinforcements so they could garrison Ticonderoga and Burgoyne could actually take his whole army off to pursue they those Americans. Terrorists, so again, as a result, the British spent so a lot of July tactics. just kind of milling about at the south end of Lake Champlain, engaging in small clashes with the Americans, but there really were no major engagements during that time. But it's at this time that that 400-man war party from Mishlamackinac finally shows up. So let's actually look at their contributions to the Burgoyne campaign next. So even as the main body of Burgoyne's army was moving south along Lake Champlain, De Peister was still continuing the war effort here at Michelinackinac, even after that war party had departed. He actually spent most of the summer of 1777 trying to counter Spanish and American influence amongst the tribes of the far west. They had agents out trying to stir up those tribal groups, uh, maybe trying to turn them against the British, or at the very least trying to convince those groups to remain neutral. De Peister, in turn, relied upon a whole network of traders based here at Michelinackinac. Many of those people had relatives in these native communities, and so De Peister tasked them with dispelling a lot of these rumors. Here at Michelinackinac, he also arrested a trader, a man named Thomas Bentley, who was accused of stirring up the tribes down in the Illinois country and just generally being a rebel agitator. Now, Langlade's war party actually reached Sounds Montreal like me, at the Avatar. end of June. They were dispatched south to link up with Burgoyne, and they ended up joining the main army on about July 17th. And the British army at this point in time was kind of stuck between Lake Champlain and the Hudson River. There was a lot of low-level fighting going on, and in fact, the Michelinackinac war party was probably in action for the first time on about July 20th at a place called Fort Anne. Again, these were not big set-piece battles. Instead, there were small raids on outposts. There were skirmishes between small groups of soldiers. But again, the Michelinackinac War Party sees combat for the first time on July 20th. Now, just about a week later, the Michelinackinac War Party would be involved in a pretty controversial incident. On July 26th, uh, members of that war party had, they had fought a small battle earlier in the morning. Uh, a rainstorm had kind of put an end to that battle and they had taken shelter in some abandoned houses around Fort Ann. Uh, and while they were in those houses, they discovered a couple of women, including a young woman named Jane McRae, who was an American. She was engaged to a loyalist officer serving with Burgoyne's army. And so these men in the war party decided to escort her back to the British camp. Uh, and they expected some sort of reward for doing that, for getting her there safely. At some point, an argument broke out, apparently over who would get to claim that reward. And to resolve that argument, one of the men of that war party, who was probably an Anishinaabe man, perhaps an Odawa man, so probably someone from here at Michelinackinac, simply killed Jane McRae as an easy way to resolve that dispute. There was really nothing surprising about that. That was pretty common uh, when dealing with uh, prisoners or people that were being escorted. It was seen as a perfectly normal way of resolving this dispute. So the men of that war party didn't think much of it and went about their business. They went back to the British camp later that day. But when Burgoyne and the other British officers found out about this, they were furious. And so the next day on July 27th, they actually convened a council with all of the native men serving with Burgoyne's army. And Burgoyne lectured them at length about how wrong this had been. Uh, and many of these native warriors decided that they had had enough. They didn't need to be yelled at by Burgoyne. They didn't need to be yelled at by this man who didn't understand their culture or their way of fighting. And they were ready to leave right then. They were ready to pack up and go home on July 27th. Fortunately, Langlade and some of the other liaison officers were able to kind of calm them down and convince them to stay, but Burgoyne did institute some new additional rules to further govern the way that those war parties were going to be fighting. Now, contrary to popular belief, the murder of Jane McRae was really not a propaganda tool for the Americans. People have claimed for a long time that the Americans looked at this uh, and used it to their advantage to point out how brutal the British were in employing their Native American allies uh, on the battlefield. But in fact, it actually had the opposite effect. It heightened the terror that Americans had of these war parties. Uh, and Burgoyne really didn't see that. All he saw was the potential damage that this incident would do to the British war effort. So this council on July 27th really marks a break between a lot of the Native men serving alongside Burgoyne's army 
and the British command structure. And they're just going to limp along for the next few days. And in fact, by about August 5th, the Michelin Mackinac War Party went to Burgoyne and asked him to leave. They wanted to go home then because for them, they had accomplished their mission. They had traveled a great distance. They had fought in battle. They had won some personal honor. They had captured uh, some prizes that they could take back home with them. And for those men, they had accomplished what they had set out to do. Burgoyne had to intervene and he essentially begged them to stay with his army a little bit longer. He was getting ready to move further south, to move, move towards Albany. And he at least convinced that Michelin Mackinac war party to stick around with the main body of the British force until they got to Albany. And soon thereafter, Burgoyne started moving again and the campaign would start to enter its final phases. So although the various native groups fighting alongside the British were getting more and more dissatisfied with the way that Burgoyne was treating them and the way that the war was going, they decided to stick with Burgoyne as he moved the army towards the Hudson River, towards Albany. Go straight. I actually don't know. I, I assume that Now keep that in mind that this is not the only campaign taking place I didn't at this see your point rumble message, time. But, uh, there was still that diversionary uh, attack taking white place pants in, in the western New York uniform. where Barry St. Ledger was supposed to attack targets in the I Mohawk so. Valley. That uh, got underway a little bit earlier in the summer, again, using a large combined force of British soldiers and Native American men from a variety of different nations. And that went okay until the British got to a place called Fort Stanwix. They expected to find that fort in ruins, but instead, once they got there, they discovered that the Americans had heavily fortified it. St. Ledger's forces were not equipped for a protracted siege, so all they could do was essentially wait outside. Uh, in early August, they actually fought an incredibly violent battle nearby at a place called Oriskany. Uh, it was a British victory. They inflicted terrible losses upon the Americans, but they simply could not dislodge them from Fort Stanwix. And ultimately, towards the end of August, St. Ledger was forced to withdraw. The Americans were pretty badass. So that dudes. whole diversionary Real. attack kind of ended in failure. It didn't really accomplish much of anything. You William say. Howe, however, experienced quite a bit more success. Again, he's commanding the main British army in the American colonies. Uh, and in fact, by September, he had been able to capture Philadelphia. He had landed a huge army, marched overland, uh, and captured the rebel capital. The Continental Congress had to flee out into the countryside. And Howe then settled into winter quarters in Philadelphia. Uh, meanwhile, the Americans also went into their winter quarters. This is where they go into winter quarters at Valley Forge. And they essentially decided to wait one another out until the 1778 campaign season. Now, back in New York, Burgoyne continues to march his forces along the Hudson River. Meanwhile, the Americans, who had escaped more or less unscathed from Ticonderoga back in the early part of July, were starting to fortify a place called Saratoga. And that's ultimately where the British and the Americans would meet. But as all this is going on, dissatisfaction amongst those various native war parties continues to grow. And so by about August 20th, the Michelin Mackinac War Party, Langlade's War Party, they've decided that they have had enough and they departed. So they actually left Burgoyne at that point. Many of the other native groups followed suit soon thereafter. And so when Burgoyne did begin engaging the Americans around Saratoga yeah. in September, there were very few, if any Native Americans still fighting alongside the British army. Now, yeah, the British were gonna, suffering from all sorts of troubles, most, most weren't hang out here supply they weren't lines tough. as they started to engage the it Americans around uh, Saratoga. Uh, and once again, and the whole campaign kind of got bogged down into a much Especially more static situation. The, the British were able to engage the Americans successfully a few times, but with more and more casualties, with fewer and, and climate fewer reinforcements, change. Uh, you know, with the British Army occupying Philadelphia, Howe was not able to send reinforcements, which they already knew that was going to happen, but it just really hammered things home. By mid-October, actually October 17th, Burgoyne was actually forced to surrender what was left of the British uh, Army at Saratoga to the Americans. And this was a major victory for the American forces. Uh, not only had they defeated this northern invasion, they had defeated Burgoyne's army, they also got some attention on the international stage because it's after this American victory at Saratoga that the French government really started to pay attention to what the Americans were doing. The French had clandestinely been supplying the Americans with arms, with money, they had been sending officers over. So for instance, the Marquis de Lafayette had joined the American army earlier that summer. But after Saratoga, 
the French decided to throw in their hats with the Americans, uh, and that choice would actually turn the American Revolution into a world war. Now, fortunately, Langlade and the Michelinacanal War Party left before any of that, that happened, so they were not caught up uh, in the capitulation at Saratoga. Uh, but because they were traveling at that point in time, people here at Michelinacanal really were unclear about Wow, they kind of just cut him off mid-sentence. Uh, I thought it was a lot of information, but a lot of good information. Um, I, I'm just fascinated by this by this giant fort on the on the lakefront. It's it's incredible to see, um, and in great st strategic location, especially with everything that was going on at the time. Um, I can't uh, I can't do a live stream with that without a cannon uh i i really i looked into your your thing and uh the british use white pants and the red coat uniforms yeah it was kind of a cream color uh the red coat was why it was called the red coat uh, because the only thing that was red was a coat from from the little bit that i read i don't know a ton about about british history or revolutionary history um but it seems that their pants were pants and undershirts were a cream colored uh uniform with specifically a red coat go street to answer your question um but it would be cool to visit yeah it's it's really cool i i visited a while ago um we drive over it every summer um and you could see it from the bridge uh, the the bridge literally goes over the visitor center for the for the fort. Um, it's really neat, and they do battle reenactments and that kind of shit. It's it's really neat. Um, so maybe I'll maybe I'll go up in the summer. I mean, it's northern Michigan, so you're not doing anything in the winter. Um, anything, nothing at all. <laughs> so maybe I'll go up in the. Uh, in the spring take some video and maybe do a live stream or something from there um so uh this is one of the coolest things and i definitely want to do this should have gone with red or brown pants yeah probably um so this is the cannon one of the cannons so you can like i said you can pay to fire the cannons because they fire them every morning when it opens um so this is a video of them firing the cannons at the fort. There's also another fort for what it's worth. There's another fort on Mackinac Island that was a British fort. Um, and that's a very interesting fort too. How much does it cost to fire the cannon? I don't actually know. I know it's relatively expensive. Um, I can look. Because uh, it's under Mackinac Historic Parks. Cannon at Mish. Um, uh, oh, it's not bad. Like they, so they have a single one, um, that's about a hundred bucks, and then uh, they have all you, where you can go around and fire all the ones at the opening, and that one's a little bit more, but uh, but yeah, it's only a hundred bucks to to fire this specific cannon, so um, but yeah, there's I think there's seven or eight cannons on on the property, and they fire them all in the morning, so. But yeah, maybe in the spring I'll I'll go do this one. <laughs> in the live stream. <laughs> Yeah, 
Can I just say that would be shit hard work and thank God for motors. <laughs> the cannon that we have here is known as a field. The other end of the sponge the rammers. Fire! Oh, it's so fucking cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it in the spring. I don't know if I can do a lobster uniform, though. I, I think I'm too American for that, and I might lose my both my American and French card. So. And I don't know that I can lose both of them. But, but yeah, um, it's something I wanted to do, so I'll probably do it and, and stream it this summer, spring, summer. Um, there's really you don't you don't do shit during the winter up there, so. Um. Yeah, no, it's really cool. So, uh, but yeah, so that takes us through the the Revolutionary War. Um, so coming up, so next week we'll do early American Detroit. So, uh, a lot of things that happened post war. A lot of the. The normal things like the post office, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. Some cool stuff that happened uh, during that time. And, and next week, we'll go all the way up to 1860. 1860 is the end of the Boomtown era in Detroit. Um, and that will take us into the next week, the next week's week, uh, where we'll do the industrial area era of Detroit, where we get, you know, the automotive manufacturers and stuff like that. It really, truly is. How much brass is in that canyon? Probably a ton. It really, truly is a great city. Um, I know everybody gives me shit for it and doesn't understand how much that uh, you come to love the city when you are when you're definitely here. <laughs> so it's a Detroiter thing, but we we truly do absolutely love the city. Um. And it's one of those things that if you're not from it, I understand why you don't understand it. But, um, yeah. But, oh, hell no. Hell no. <laughs> but, so that's going to be it for me for this. We're all the way up past the Revolutionary War. Plenty more to come. Um, and then, like I said, after following that week so three weeks from now we'll get into uh kind of what brought us into the the race rides that we covered the first week we'll get into the model cities program uh some of the things that really tore detroit apart and and that will probably be if not the end of it pretty close to the end of it um but yeah we'll go from there and uh we'll see where we get so Ladies and gentlemen, we are back to covering the Matt Moore trial again tomorrow. Uh, Matthew will join us tomorrow. What's up, Josh? Yeah, I'm not even mad about it, brother. Hey, no worries. I I love it. So, um, yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh, and there'll probably be there'll probably be four more shows because we'll have to do. I, I forget about it, but we'll have to do the things like Motown and, and that kind of shit. So uh, there's plenty, plenty of couple or certainly a couple, a uh, couple more coming up for sure. So uh, that's going to be for me again tomorrow. Uh, Matt Moore will be joining us again for the trial. We'll, we'll get a little further in that. Um, and then Tuesday, we'll go back into what kind of tensions are on the planet Wednesday off. Thursday, we'll get back to the news and then we'll do it all over again. Hope everyone had a wonderful holiday weekend and has a wonderful Sunday evening, night. And I will catch you guys all very soon. Have a good night, everybody. Detroit, Michigan. Oh, yeah. Detroit, Michigan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Detroit, Michigan. Yeah.